Good evening, Prague. It's great to be here at Paralenipolis, an institute of crypto, an crypto anarchy. I've wanted for a very long time to come here, but there's always been something that showed up at the last minute. So this is really one of these ticks in the box of things I wanted to do for, for a long time. So thank you for inviting me. Today we're going to talk a little bit about organizing the swarm way and what that means and what benefits it brings. My Twitter handle is Falkvinge, just my last name. If I say something smart, if I say something absolutely stupid, feel free to quote me. I love seeing my name on Twitter, even if it's dumb as a brick. So, a little bit about my history is that I'm the founder of the first pirate party. There is a pirate party in the Czech, here in the Czech parliament. It's one of roughly 70 pirate parties, depending on how you count. I founded the first one and led it into the European Parliament in 2009. And I did that on less than 1% of the competition's budget. Everybody is always gunning for the sub-30 demographic, because you want the first-time voters and not necessarily the last-time voters, because the first-time voters tend to stick with you, not, not, not necessarily the last-time voters. And we beat them. We beat them on less than 1% of their budget. Put two people into the European Parliament. And so I was also early into Bitcoin. Spring 2011, I started evangelizing on my blog, and a lot of people are coming up to me now and saying that, oh, Rick, I read your posts. I'm so happy you wrote about this. I went, I went I, so much into Bitcoin in 2011. Thank you so much for making me financially independent by now. And it's nice to hear that, you know? And I, I imagine there's a lot of stories similar to that here at, at Paralelnipolis and Crypt, uh, Institute of Crypto Anarchy. So, Today's entertainment. We're going to look a little bit about what the Swarm organization is, how leadership can just be enabling people to do what they want, as long as you're focusing all of these people in generally the same direction, and how you optimize this for a Swarm organization. Let's take it from the beginning. How do you inspire a swarm organization? A swarm organization, I usually define it as tens of thousands of volunteers that generally work in the same, in the same direction. They don't need to be working on the same thing. They don't need to be working in the same way. They don't need to be aware of each other. But let's compare this to how it used to be. If, say, if you needed to start up an organization and you estimate you need 4,000 work hours per week in total, then the old way would be to hire 100 employees of 40, 40, working 40 hours per week. That's a shitload of money. <laughs> As in, there's not a lot of us who, who can pony up that kind of money. Now, in contrast, imagine if you can get 2,000 volunteers who want to see the same change that you do work in your general direction just two hours a week apart from their day job. That means you've got your 4,000 work hours per week. And their, their win is that by working inside your organization, they are having a bigger output than if they had done the exact same thing on their own. So they have an incentive to work with you, and you have an obvious incentive to work with them because you don't need to pay them. This creates an entirely new type of organization. And it's running circles around the establishment. There is a Futurama quote that applies very well to this. There is a Futurama quote. 
when push comes to shove, you got to do what you love, even if it's not a good idea. Just to highlight one example there, what kind of an idiot thinks they can start a new party and actually get into parliament and change something? <laughs> so the way you do this, the way you solidly start a swarm is that you announce your goal. I'm going to do this. Who's with me? And for me, this wasn't a big bang. I had a really ugly web page set up. It was what I had managed to set up over the New Year's and Christmas holidays. I'm not, I'm not joking. It was ugly. Capital U ugly. And the only announcement I did was two lines in a chat channel. I logged on to a file sharing network hub, wrote in the lobby, hey, look, the Pirate Party has its website up now after New Year's and the address. That's all the advertising I ever did, and it detonated. It just detonated. And I took the lesson with me that in order to succeed with this, you need four criteria when you're announcing. You need four criteria for people to actually start spreading this word and, and snowballing the initiative you started. Those four criteria are that it needs to be tangible, credible, inclusive, and epic. Let's take them one at a time. Tangible. There's lots of organizations started with the ambition like, you know, we should like all feel like good man. And while this is a laudable good, a laudable goal that everybody should be happy and feel good, it's very hard to measure if you've gotten to your goal yet. It needs to be credible. Everybody needs to see this as achievable. Going to Mars was seen as impossible until Elon Musk outlined, here's how we're going to go from A to B. This is exactly how we're going to do it. And as long as every single step is seen as achievable, and you are adding these steps together to do the impossible, then people will see the plan as a whole as credible. It needs to be inclusive. It needs to be inclusive. When people see your plan, they need to go, Yes, there's my spot. I want to be a part of this, and that's exactly what I'm going to do in this plan. I'm grabbing this. I'm starting right now. I'm not asking anybody. This is what's happening. Just the other day, somebody took my software and started translating it into Chinese. And I'm like, how did you even hear of this software? Last but not least, epic. It needs to be epic. Shoot for the moon is my classic line here. And I'm following up with saying that don't shoot for the moon because we've already been there. It's boring now. Shoot for Mars. And then Elon Musk came and said, hey, we're actually going to go for Mars. And so he ruined my entire presentation. But that's the, that's the thing. You, can't, you need an epic goal. You can't say, yes. We are going to write Germany's third best tax audit software. And, and expect a lot of volunteers to come from that. In our case, in the Pirate Party, we said, you know what? We're going to kick these shithead lawmakers out of office who don't understand the net. Everybody thought, oh, wait, you can do that. You don't need to clench your fist in your pocket. You can actually kick them out of office for not understanding the net. And I presented a plan to do it, and I executed it, and we kicked them out of office. This, that's also happening here, here in Czech Republic and, and in a number of other places. So a pro, a pe one piece of project management wisdom here is that just because something is hard, is not a reason to shy away from it. Don't fear obstacles. Don't fear obstacles. Fear the dark. Fear the dark. If you know how high that mountain is, 
then you know exactly the amount of resources you need to scale it. If you know how far away Mars is, and we do, then you know exactly what kind of resources and power it takes to get there. You can start outlining, let's see, we need two dozen volunteer rocket scientists, probably about a dozen metallurgists, somebody crazy enough to mix hypergolic rocket fuel in their backyard, and so on. Anything you can plan like a project, you can execute like a project. Don't fear obstacles. Just because somebody hasn't done it before doesn't mean it can't be done as long as it's within the laws of physics. So once you've started, once you've bootstrapped this swarm organization, how do you run it, which is, is the next question. How do you optimize the swarm organization? And there are three important factors for that. Three important factors. And a lot of them go completely counter to what they teach you at an MBA. Those three factors are speed, trust, and scalability. Speed, trust, and scalability. Speed first. You take yourself out of the loop. You are an enormous bottleneck in any organization as the founder. If everybody needs to go with you, the organization will not function. It will not function. Because you only have 24 hours per day, you only have this, this amount of time to resp respond to requests, you're going to get decision fatigue and burn out in no time, and then the, then the project is over. Take yourself out of the loop. Trust that the people who have joined your project share your goals, maybe not to 100%, but m enough that it'll work well enough. It doesn't need to be perfect. It's enough that tens of thousands of people do something in the generally right direction every day, and you have an unstoppable momentum. Take yourself out of the loop. We had something called a three pirate rule in the pirate party. What this meant was that when three pirates, self-identified pirates, were in agreement that something was good for the party, any three people, then they had a green light to do anything in the name of the party, including spend its resources. <laughs> I mean, Wall Street executives talk about decentralization. They talk about empowerment. They talk about trust. When I present this to Wall Street executives, they drop their jaws and say, are you fucking insane? You can't, you, you can't, you can't, you can't decentralize power to this degree. It's not going to work. It can't work. You know what? I led the Swedish Pirate Party for five years, peaking at 50,000 members. Among 50,000 people, this was not abused once. Not once. It turns out that when you give people the keys to the castle, look them in the eye and say, I trust you. I know we're in this together, we're standing shoulder to shoulder. Then hell, what, what a way they raise to the occasion. They step up to the plate in a way you'd never see happen before. Also, all things don't go well. Of course some things are going to fail. We need to learn to expect mistakes. But the key thing to understanding this is that even the biggest organizations make mistakes. Even the most resource-rich organizations make the most mind-boggling mistakes. And my favorite here is a Swedish hospital landlord. Hospital landlord, as in they're renting out the, the um, hospital's facilities to the actual people running the hospital. Their, the name of the company in Sweden is Locum. It looks like this. It's a fairly good name for a landlord. just means location, written in lowercase, like this. Uh, but they had a pretty bad reputation in Sweden. You know, they were, greedy. they were the greedy suckers who were bleeding healthcare dry. 
So they decided to portray themselves as a warm and friendly company. And remember now, this is a multi-billion company. This is a multi-billion company. They decided to portray themselves as a warm and friendly company. So in a huge ad campaign in the, uh, during the, the Christmas of 2001, they replaced the O in their logo with a big red heart and plastered it all over Swedish media. And I'm not making this up. You can, if you're searching for logo, uh, if you're searching for locum advertising, you're going to find what this ad actually looked like immediately. And I mean, anybody who can that make that kind of mistake, if that big an organization can make that big a mistake, then you can probably chill a little. Yeah, somebody saw it here and is is laughing like hell and face palming. It is funny. I'm not going to show what it looks like, but you can imagine it. Well, if you're replacing the O with a big red heart, you can sort of see what, it's got, what it says instead. I love cum. <laughs> yeah. So, stop worrying about making mistakes. No amount of additional checks, additional controls, additional approvals is going to prevent mistakes. And once you take on this Zen attitude, you're getting a completely different speed. Because every mistake becomes a learning opportunity. Every, every mistakes, all mistakes becomes something that is just a lesson on the path to success. And this iteration speed is absolutely crucial, but because it might be that you need to do something 15 times in order to get it perfect. The quicker you'd make these 15 lessons, the quicker you make it perfect. And every single gate, every single check, every single control, every single green light that is necessary is going to slow this down, is going to slow your organization down. Second, trust. Encourage diversity. And I don't mean diversity of skin color and gender and the usual identity politics here. I mean diversity of thought, diversity of social circles. We trust each other that we're sharing the same general goal. I have absolutely no idea what the person over there is doing or how this is going to forward the goal, but I know they're sharing the same vision as I am. And so, what, since they are in a different social context than I am, then maybe it's going to work there, and I'm just not that familiar with the social context to understand why. When everybody around us thinks this way, everybody trusts each other to do their best in their own context, you're getting a massive amount of attempts tried in parallel, most of which work to some degree, some of which don't work, and it's okay. Your colleagues, and this is what they don't teach you at the MBA, your colleagues need to translate your vision. You have a vision, your colleagues need to translate it into their social language. Because language is, an, is a marker for inclusion and for exclusion. When I'm going to an entrepreneur's, an entrepreneur, a libertarian camp, and saying that it's great that we got file sharing because it eliminates a parasitic link in the value chain that is no longer necessary to, to deliver value to the end user. And so we can have, and so the end cost is going to, slow, to slowly approach the, the market production cost. The end price is going to slowly um, asymptotically approach the, uh, the production cost instead of having a dead weight in between when I'm talking about the copyright industry. That's going to work with a libertarian crowd. When I'm talking to a dark red crowd, I need to say something along the lines that it is glorious that our cultural brothers and sisters in, in the, who are cultural workers have thrown off this weight of the capitalistic middle capitalistic parasites who have been just taking their money from their work and it's 
absolutely glorious that we can reuse this, these funds to create more work for our brothers and sisters. And I'm saying the exact same thing semantically. The message, when broken down to what I'm saying, is exactly the same thing. But one message will mark me as an outsider, and thereby automatically somebody who's wrong in one group, and the other language will be heard as an insider group. Therefore, it is absolutely crucial that you're letting each and every person translate your vision into the social language of their context. And this is, goes completely counter with what they teach you at an MBA, where you need one consistent message for your product. You don't need one consistent message for your product. You need a consistent vision, and you need it translated to fit every single individual through your colleagues who are using their social context to do so. People are aware of the and different approaches tried in parallel. Yes, I did already talked about that. Scalability. Getting the feet off the ground, on the ground even. <laughs> Getting the feet on the ground. When you're creating a scaffolding, from the top, uh, where in the top you have a box called world, then you have boxes for continents, then you have boxes for countries, boxes for counties, boxes for cities, boxes for blocks. You start out with your name in the world box. Over time, you'll find people you work with and you assign them to dis different tasks, maybe continents, maybe something else, but things that report to you in general. Over time, they will start appointing people in their turn. And by having these empty boxes at the start, signaling that it's okay to fill these roles, then in very short order, the organization will grow beyond your horizon. Somebody will get appointed to one of these empty boxes, a person that you had never heard of. And this is how you create the organization that grows. This is where most people who are doing open source software and so on fail, that they are unable to scale beyond their own horizon. And so you're creating a decentralized organization with many, many small responsibilities. It could be as simple as, as saying, hey, I've noticed that people contact you when they, when they want the PA equipment to hold a rally in this town. Would you mind us listing that formally like, so that everybody knows th to contact you, since that's the practice anyway? And usually they'll, they'll say yes. And that way you have another little name in a box. Small, small responsibilities, tens of thousands of them, bring this kind of power. And what happens when you have this many people who all are doing something small, completely autonomously, but where you set the original goal, the original vision, then a swarm intelligence emerges. A swarm intelligence emerges. And if you've been a project leader, this is a magic moment where you've gone people burned up to the point, in, excited to the point where they start self-organizing to reach the goal you just communicated. You've taken yourself out of the loop. People are sharing work left and right. People are trying things, trying new things, doing this, doing that. Oh, that worked. Let's all copy that. Let's remix that. And everybody is working toward the goal you set, just because you happened to provide a framework, a framework which was much more effective for people to use than to go about the same thing on their own. And providing this framework for many people to work without anybody telling them what to do that is what gives a cost efficiency advantage of two orders of magnitude. We're not talking about shaving off 2% of costs here. We won on less than 1% of the competition's budget. 
And this is a copyable rep recipe. People are trying this and repeating it, and it works time and time again. As long as you fulfill these four criteria, tangible, credible, epic, and, uh, epic and inclusive. So, do you want to change the world? That's the question you should be asking yourself. Do you want to change the world? Maybe bring clean water to a billion people. You might want to teach three billion people to read. Or for that matter, introduce unconditional income. Voluntary, of course. At the end of the day, it's about leadership. It's about standing up, like I said in the beginning, and saying, I'm going to do this. Who's with me? Who, wa who wants to also do this? Because there is a saying, I forget who it's from, but it's very true. It says that whether you believe you can or cannot change the world, whether you believe you can or cannot change the world, you're probably right. Things don't just, change doesn't just happen. Somebody always makes it happen. So whenever you're setting out on something, I want you to ask yourself this question. Do you want to be that person? Do you want to be that person that causes this change? And just one more thing before we end. Something that a lot of people talk about and most people do wrong, which is fun. Fun in a swarm organization is much, more, uh, is much more about just having fun on the job. It is, much more about, it is much more than just enjoying your work. It's actually a requirement for success. It's a requirement for success. This is not about putting a pinball machine in the basement, which a startup would call fun and expect it to attract more, uh, attract more talent. Having fun is about something as simple as attracting more volunteers. You attract more people if you're having fun. It sounds so simple when you say it, yet so many people forget it once they're starting to try to execute a project. Because people go, where, people go to other people who are having fun. Hey, look over there. That looks interesting. They're all laughing. They're doing cool shit. Let's go there. In contrast, if you're seeing a lot of people just infighting and generally having a miserable time, you're going to spend energy avoiding them. Having fun is much more than just enjoying your work. It's a requirement for success. And once you've accepted it as a requirement for success, <laughs> hey, you get the bonus of having fun on your job, which isn't too bad a perk. So, in summary, how you create a swarm organization. The goal, it needs to be tangible, credible, inclusive, and epic. You optimize it for speed, trust, and scalability. You are having fun. I cannot emphasize this enough. It's you are having fun. And your reward will be two orders of magnitude of cost efficiency advantage over the old world. Two orders of magnitude. And here comes the battle. Uh, here comes the. I forget the name of the movie, but it doesn't matter. Do you want to know more? Uh, this has been a quick summary of a book I wrote. Starship Troopers, of course. Do you, know, do you want to know more? The, the book is called Swarmwise. It contains much more in-depth, practical tips about how to do all of these things. There is, it's available for free as a PDF on, on uh, my blog slash books. If you search for the name, you'll find it immediately. It's also available in print to buy if you prefer to have, uh, have something to, in your hands. Uh, there is software which is now in beta, which is, as to my knowledge, is the only one of its kind, 
which helps you organize like this, which is called swarm ops, swarm operations, which is what, which is what we talked about uh, with Lieberland today and which Lieberland is just launching as a pilot, which I'm very happy about and which I'm very eager to support. That project can also be found here on GitHub swarm up, uh, slash swarm up, slash swarm ups. It is public domain, means that it's free for, any, for anyone to use for any purpose. And that's what I have today. Thank you for listening. I think we can do a short discussion. All right, so I'll stay. If you, have if you have any question, just raise your hand. I will give you a microphone so we get the discussion recorded. You said one moment in, a, in the pirate uh, party. There's a, a you know, breakdown that the people started organizing themselves. How did, how did you, as a central brain of the party, how did you recognize that they are doing the right activity? So who was the, who was the referee to, to judge if, if their activities are beneficial for the party? The good thing is you don't need that. Because once people have joined the party, you can s mo there a big enough proportion of them have joined for the right reasons. So even if somebody is completely out there, and there certainly were unidentified flying objects in the member core, I'm not going to dispute that. <laughs> Somebody said that half of the people in the Pirate Party probably have a diagnosis and the other half deserve one. But the thing is, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's enough to get it 75% right or 80% or right. And this momentum of getting it generally right will take care of the rest. And this is about getting that Zen idea that it's okay if some things go completely wrong because they do even if you're a billion dollar company. Um, okay, as you might know, I have uh quite different example for the rest of you. Uh, I'm the founder of Croatian Pirate Party and we stumbled upon problems because we basically had uh, too much voting, uh, which later become a mob rule. Yep. So how do you avoid that? I hate voting. Yeah, me too. In the book, in the book Swarm Ops, uh, Swarm Wise, there's a whole chapter saying, with, with the title, Screw Democracy, We're on a Mission from God. And the key to, to understanding why voting is bad is that, by definition, it creates losers. The process of voting creates losers. And losers are unhappy people, and unhappy people disengage from the project. So it quickly become uh, so people quickly become concerned about winning or losing a vote, and so they remove their focus from the big goal and instead get nervous about not being part of the winning team internally. This is a very very basic instinct in us. This is tribal. So. By instead saying that any three people are empowered to do anything you want. And you have to reinforce that just because you're three people doesn't mean you can take any decision for the entire organization. It just means you get to authorize yourselves. You do not get to disempower other people. And this is a very hard concept for many, that power is power. How can, authorize, how can authorizing power not be the same as deauthorizing? But it, it's all about the ability to do what you want. It's about voluntarism. It's about not having power over others, but having power over yourself. So this was how, how we sold it in the Swedish Pirate Party while I was party leader. When I was no longer party leader, the Swedish Pirate Party happened just the way you did. It was, got dreadlocked in a marsh of 
Yeah. Okay. Processes. Thank you. And my next question would be addressed to uh, Jan, I'm guessing. Uh, what are Liberland's plan for uh, decision-making process? You know, this is very, very inspirative for me today because uh, um, I think we are experiencing something, something similar, you know, and I was sometimes wondering uh, how we can manage all the people doing some activities on the other part of the world, you know, somewhere really far, and uh, this is basically the explanation. So the tendencies to centrally, you know, not necessarily control, but just even monitor, it's, it's almost impossible to evaluate if it was 100% good activity or 50%, and your answer is absolutely excellent because we just can be satisfied that it's Sometimes it's 50% good, sometimes it's 100, 10%, but in average it's moving the, all the, all the you know, movement forwards. Mm. So that's, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, the centralization is a powerful concept. I'm, I'm wondering if it has any limit. For example, uh, does liberal land need a president? who was mentioned. Does Libela need a president? I would argue yes, Libela needs a president for the same reason the Swedish Pirate Party needed a party leader. It needs to interface with the old world. When reporters, when the old world came, maybe WikiLeaks is a better example. Uh, I was uh, talking to Julian Assange over dinner over this, and it struck him how ineffective WikiLeaks was when they just said, we have no leader, we have no face, we have no nothing, you can't talk to us about anything. And it just didn't work. And once Julian Assange stepped up to be the face of WikiLeaks, then reporters had a face to put with the, with the movement, with the organization, and so it became possible to talk about it in, in terms of the old world. This is exactly my experience as well, that you need what I call an avatar. And this is really hard as a leader, because the, your role as an avatar, an embodiment of the project, a face of the project, is not who you are personally. It is just a face that old media puts on television and prints in newspapers. And you represent the movement in the role of this embodiment, in, in this avatar. As long as we are still in this halfway world between the old and the new, I would argue that you need to interface with the old. You need a way that, to communicate with the old that the old recognizes. And so I would argue a president or some sort of avatar is needed, just as I was needed as party leader for the Pirate Party, just as Julian Assange was needed for WikiLeaks and so on. Thank you very much, Rick, for your uh, talk. Thank you so really much inspiring. for inviting me here. It was, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.